Hi everyone, my name is Melanie Grant and this is CNM Glass. Today's topic will be on ICD-10 CM coding for signs, symptoms, and abnormal labs, review of ICD-10 CM codes R00 through R99. Our key points today, we'll be looking at the signs and symptoms uh, specific to outpatient versus inpatient coding when, with uncertainties and abnormal labs. So, let's get started. First and foremost, we are going to be referencing ICD-10 CM codebook from the APC Expert Edition as shown here for the 2019 year. It's okay if you have a different codebook. If you're coding along, I'll be referencing pages and the guidelines in the 2019 codebook, which will be the same guidelines and codes as in any edition of the same year. So, First things first, there's a few things about science symptoms and abnormal labs. And we don't have a chapter reading on this, but it's extraordinarily important before we really get in too deep into ICD-10 diagnoses that we understand when should we list a, a code for a sign and symptom or an abnormal lab and when we should list the diagnosis of a disease or illness in, or injury instead. So by definition, your signs, symptoms, and abnormal labs. If I look on page 955, there's some notes and guidelines that talk to us about this. These are for symptoms, signs, abnormal results of clinical or other investigative procedures and ill-defined conditions regarding which no diagnosis classifiable elsewhere is recorded. In other words, this is going to be used whenever there is no diagnosis that the sign or symptom is uh, associated with in the documentation or uh, a clear diagnosis that includes that sign or symptom. We'll talk about that here in just a second. Signs and symptoms point rather differently, definitively to a given diagnosis have been, a, excuse me, signs and symptoms that point definitively to a given diagnosis that are assigned to a category in other chapters of classification in general, categories in this chapter include the less well-defined conditions and symptoms that, without necessary study of the case to establish a final diagnosis, point perhaps equally to two or more diseases or two or more systems of the body. And so it goes on from there. What does that all mean? Well, if the provider has an uncertain or an unconfirmed diagnosis, then a sign and symptom should be used when in the outpatient setting. You'll notice that this is different from inpatient coding because when we have a suspected or an unconfirmed diagnosis on the inpatient setting, we code that condition as if it happened. But in all outpatient facilities, we want to make sure that we only code what is documented with certainty by the provider. So if they're doing any kind of terminology such as suspected, probable, rule out, those are all terms indicating an uncertain diagnosis. And when that happens, we have to determine the signs and symptoms found in the patient's note in order to say what it was that they were seen for because that diagnosis, the condition, cannot be listed. So typically, this is going to be found in your S section for your SOAP note or your subjective information. This has things like your chief complaint or your HPI and sometimes your review of systems, which will have signs and symptoms often listed. Sometimes you'll also find it in your exam, and they may even list it as part of the assessment. So they may say a suspected asthma with uh, issue, uh, difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, and you would go back and say, we cannot code asthma if it's identified as suspected, but we could uh, code for the condition that it's with, which would be um, difficulty or shortness of breath. So any of your symptoms that are indicated. Okay, now your guidelines do go on to talk about um, if a, diagnos a diagnosis is established and a sign and symptom is included, we would not code the additional sign and symptoms that are part of the diagnosis. You would only code if it's atypical to the diagnosis, meaning uh, separate of what's common with that diagnosis. So you may be sitting there and thinking, oh my gosh, 
How am I gonna know every sign and symptom that's for every diagnosis? That's a lot of reading, oh no. But rest assured, there's resources out there for coders. My absolute favorite is the Merck Manual. If you go into your HIT resources associated with the class this video is for, you'll find a link to Merck Manual for Professionals, or you can just go online and Google it. The Merck Manual provides information about common diagnoses as well as uncommon diagnoses, what kinds of signs and symptoms they have, what kind of treatments. I mean, pretty much everything there is to know uh, currently about that diagnosis from a professional standpoint is listed in there, including prognosis, uh, specifics and medications and recommendations for treatment. So when you're looking at something such as asthma and you wanna find what common signs and symptoms are part of a condition such as asthma, you may go to the Merck manual, you'll type in asthma or the type of asthma they have and look for uh, the section that says signs and symptoms, and it'll list all the common uh, signs and symptoms associated with that condition. The next thing uh, that we talk about, one of your guidelines talks about, is false. Now, on your uh, ICD 10 CM guidelines, page 21 of the guidelines section, it says in here that repeated falls are to be coded to R29.6. Okay, forgive my writing today. My, uh, I'm in a bit of a hurry as I'm going through this. So repeated falls, if I do R29.6, that means that the patient is, is being seen because they have had falls. The provider may document that as a history of falls. So it's important to pay attention to what are we doing about that. Are we treating them because they've been falling recently? If so, you would list R29.6 which is identified as encounters where when a patient has recently fallen and the reason the fall for the falls is being investigated. So we're trying to find something about it to treat them. If it's simply listed as, oh yeah, they've been falling lately. Well, you know, it's nice to know. Then that goes under a Z code for Z91.81 history of falling when they've fallen in the past and is at risk for future falls, but we're not trying to find out information about why they're falling. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of stand here a little low for, your, for those of you watching on the board. So kind of looking at signs and symptoms, keep in mind this is in lieu of a diagnosis. So if we know why they're falling, if they're falling because they're shortness of breath, for example, then we may list that instead because falling would be a common symptom of having uh, breathing issues and hopefully we found out what that shortness of breath was. Um, so like let's say COPD. Okay, now in the signs and symptoms section there's a few other areas you want to be aware of. Labs without diagnoses. Anytime you have an abnormal lab test that has come back and it has been identified and flagged as abnormal but there is not a diagnosis, we cannot diagnose the condition that that lab is identifying, even if it is something that is clear and obvious. But we can list abnormal lab findings, which you'll find in blocks. I'm reading page 955, the beginning of my chapter, nine, I'm sorry, chapter 18 um, section, which is for the coding chapter for your signs and symptoms chapter 18, and on here, I see that there's blocks for abnormal findings on examination uh, of blood without diagnoses, urine, and other bodily fluids without diagnoses, and then there's also abnormal findings on diagnostic imaging and function studies without diagnoses, okay? There's also specific code for abnormal tumor markers, and if there's an ill-defined and unknown cause of mortality. Hopefully you never have to list that one. But for the abnormal findings on exam of, those are your lab tests, those are your imaging tests, your functional tests, and that's when something is flagged as abnormal, so the results are available, you can code the abnormal result simply by saying uh, what type of test it was. You cannot code a condition based off of that. So keep that in mind. And then outside of that, the, most, the only other one that is most common 
um, that I see that's really done kind of incorrectly is pain. Okay, so we have a bunch of really cool pain codes that are in the signs and symptoms, and it's really important that you look in your note to find out if the pain that's being documented is common or related according to the documentation to any diseases or conditions a patient may have. If so, we would not code pain as a separate condition. Um, it's important when you're dealing with pregnant patients, you keep in mind, uh, for example, abdominal and pelvic pain uh, is specific to um, if it's a patient that is pregnant, it could be uh, pregnancy related versus unspecified. So your signs and symptoms are your unspecified reasons. We don't know why they have this condition, only that they're being seen for it. And when you deal with the pain conditions, for example, in the abdominal pain, there's all kinds of different details identifying to us where that pain is located at. So you have upper and left, uh, Quad, uh, right upper and left upper quadrants, uh, le lower left and lower right quadrants, epigastral pain, which is um, listed as, that's one of the ones that's always going to be kind of uh, a, a, a specific that everybody always finds that one actually has its own spot under other abdominal pain. So I had to look because that one was one that didn't used to have a code. Um, you have pain localized to the lower abdomen and it's just unspecified or periumbilical, so around the umbilical area. So abdominal pain has a lot of different areas. Um, chest pain has a lot of areas. Pay close attention to those and make sure when you're coding for pain that you remember these are symptoms uh, and signs, not conditions. So if you have a condition that is causing pain, you want to go to that instead. That's all I have for these today. Now, this week on our signs, symptoms, and abnormal labs, you're gonna find very little information in terms of reading, but you'll have some great exercises in your workbook, as well as instructor-based resources. So feel free to let me know if you have any questions. And until next time, have a great day.